uh, is uh, presented by Greg Ao Young. Uh, Greg is uh, a senior advisor at the Shanghai Fudan University, uh, but also he's a seasoned banking technology professional uh, with extensive experience across China, Hong Kong, and Japan. Uh, he also has a solid track record of pioneering, building, and managing entities, both large and small. Uh, he's currently the Greater China CIO at Saxo Bank, which is European fintech, uh, while also, of course, being uh, in his role at the Shanghai Fudan uh, University specializing in fintech. Uh, previous to that, he's held senior executive positions at State Street, Morgan Stanley, ANZ Bank, and UBS. Uh, so let's bring uh, Greg onto the screen to talk about going API first in China. Welcome, Greg. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear. It's Wonderful. Go back. You give me a second first. I'll stay on until you're all set. Okay. All right, I can see your screen, so I will leave you to it. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, uh, today, I guess I, I'll just briefly touch on the topic of uh, API first, you know, in the financial services or in financial industry within Great China, and particularly uh, mainland China uh, mostly, and then a little bit on Hong Kong as well. And uh, a lot of speakers already talked about, you know, different API strategy in, in especially in Hong Kong. And I guess uh, so far, I'm not too much about China. So maybe, uh, hopefully, this could be of interest to uh, some of the people on uh, in this uh, conference today. So let me try to do this. Oops. I'll skip my intro. Oops. Where's it gone? All right. So um, I guess before we start anything, uh, uh, before diving into the API topic, uh, let's take a, take a glance of the uh, the China regulatory bodies today. Uh, as you can see here, is the um, this is the financial regulatory body in China. Uh, the F S D F S D C is actually the a charge of a policy coordination, and then the and then the uh, the people uh, People's Bank of China is the um, uh, is the one who leads the policy formulation, and then the two commissions underneath is actually obviously the banking, insurance, and the uh, security sector. So this actually basically drive all of the financial regulations uh, within uh, China. But of course, there are uh, some complications to it because of the fact that there's a uh, um, some um, less sort of uh, significant uh, financial institutions that um, may not require the PBOC uh, approval. It could be like financial service uh, bureau, you know, that's down to the regional or uh, city government. Okay. And then the next one is actually the license. Uh, I think again before you go into the you know all this old banking structure, you know initiative. The, uh, the important thing is that uh, the traditional license is on the left. This is where the um, uh, the uh, governed by the CBIRC, you know, in insurance and banking sector, and then the CSRC, Securities and Futures, and then the other financials I mentioned earlier. And all of these are the traditional banking licenses has been going around for like decades. And um, and then the uh, on the right hand side, which is a more interesting part, is the from the last ten years or so. A lot of the new online licenses have been approved by the uh, regulator, and uh, this actually add fuel to the growth of the entire internet banking and uh, you know post I guess the e-commerce you know uh, era you know when Alibaba Jack Ma you know started that off about twenty years ago, and I think about ten years ago you know the financial revolution was undertaking you know in China, and you hear a lot about Alipay, which is actually regulated by PBOC. It was about ten years ago, and then, and and more. Um, I think the more recent is the internet banks. Uh, I think uh, my bank, for example, uh, or we bank, sorry, uh, backed by Tencent. It's actually, uh, I think, uh, covered by one of the speaker uh, earlier, and uh, this is actually uh, part of Tencent Group, but it's actually uh, a pretty uh, making a significant dent in the industry 
because of the technology that I brought in, because th this is actually, uh, they built every, every, every strategy, you know, every infrastructure tech stack, you know, uh, within their own company. And uh, they can now uh, approve a loan with less than a second. And uh, every second they can, uh, they can pr process like 250,000 transactions. So I think if you compare that with a mainstream bank, I think that's obviously is, uh, it poses a threat to them. And especially now, now that they act, uh, break into the new market, they go into the unbanked populations. They go into a lot of the areas, uh, a lot of the clientele, which the traditional banks will not go after. But, uh, but of course, you know, ever since the taking off of this uh, so-called online financial entities in China, a lot of the main banks are actually making a move as well. The next one is uh, the players. Uh, and on the left hand side, as I mentioned uh, earlier, you know, the incumbent banks, I uh, uh, just list some of them because obviously there are thousands of, you know, banks in China. And, uh, and then the, uh, what's interesting is that, you know, uh, underneath the incoming banks, uh, for the last uh, five or six years, a lot of them have created their own spin offs. Excuse me, uh, the spin offs, they, that means the, the fintech spin offs. So the purpose is very simple is to, create a new entity to compete in the fintech uh, industry and also try to create their own ecosystem or blend into integrate into the ecosystem of the current state in China. And then in the mid, uh, in the middle, you can see this is actually the, um, uh, the incumbent banks on the left and then you get the disruptors. So obviously there are many different fine, what we call financial service group in China today that has all the licenses you can imagine and they can actually uh, provide loans, they can take deposit, they can uh, do trust business, and they can do investment, uh, robot advisors, and, uh, and then of course, you know, uh, insurance businesses as well. So uh, altogether, there are roughly around 69 uh, financial service conglomerates in China. And of course, you know, the leading groups such, such as Tencent, uh, N Group will uh, lead the pack. And then, but you also have um, companies like uh, Wanda, for example, is a property de developer. And they're also very eager in, to break into this uh, fintech space. So you can see this, you know, all these different state-owned, um, private, privately-owned companies. All these are entering entry space, and that makes it, you know, very, very interesting because it's so fiercely competitive, and it will basically break or move the market. And then on the right-hand side, I think I mentioned earlier already, internet banks. You know, those are about uh, nine of them. The lic in nine of the uh, licenses have been uh, granted by the uh, by the regulator. And uh, the predominantly, I think uh, my bank, you know, which is under um, uh, Alibaba Group, and then the WeBank, uh, which is Tencent. These are the two, I would say, the uh, the key players. And of course, the all the others are actually uh, also joining force, and uh, uh, and also, uh, um, uh, you know, in terms of prob probability, um, WeBank, for example, is also risen to uh, probably a tier, you know, comparable to a tier tier two bank stage, you know, in in China. Um, so uh, it's, uh, they're making like, um, I think the net income for in 2018 was uh, half a billion uh, US dollar, which is quite significant for a, you know, for a startup, which only uh, start off, you know, uh, a few years back. And then the, the, the rest of them are just fintech, you know, pure fintech, you know, uh, uh, the ABCD, right, uh, you know, uh, you know, players, you know, uh, AI, blockchain, cloud, uh, big data, et cetera. And again, there are hundreds and thousands of them, you know, and I think I was looking at some unofficial figures, you know, well, first of all, AI companies, the mainstream ones, about 4,000 of them. And then if you're talking about every year, every month, uh, new players coming in, and uh, I think it was an unofficial figure saying that um, the quarter of a million uh, newly registered AI companies in China, that was in 2019. So I don't know how they call it, the AI, AI company, maybe hype or whatever, but you can see the, uh, the, the change in China and the rapid growth and also a lot of companies setting up, you know, from overseas or from, you know, from within China. And the next is the, in terms of uh, the regulation, open bank regulations, uh, open banking, uh, PBOC released a commercial bank, uh, so-called the API security management guideline in February, 2020, which, which is interesting because it's, um, it's actually specifically to the API securities management because uh, they obviously as a regulator, they are very, very uh, uh, conservative and they want to make sure that before you launch anything, I think this security is the key to protect the financial uh, system, the integrity of it. And that's why the uh, in here you there's uh, uh, the the paper is already is actually public you know in the uh, uh, PBOC site you can actually go in and have a look at it and uh, it's on Chinese but but I think that the key is that you know they already have this um, 
so-called the, the framework, you know, or not the framework, the, uh, the, the specific uh, specifications given to the, um, to, the, um, to the place in the market. And then um, at the same time, there will be uh, new, uh, well, the new, uh, newly formed uh, so-called uh, uh, data security law already came up uh, this year. And then the privacy law, I think, is going to come up uh, either this year or next year. So as you can see, um, all of the, uh, the new regulations are coming up in China. And that's why it probably one of the reasons why they're taking a bit of time to actually forming this whole entire open API, uh, so-called the, uh, the regulation for the industry. Uh, and in China, because a lot of the banks are jumping ahead, you know, ahead of the uh, regulators. And that's why uh, the people say it's giving um, the... Uh, the, the the actual uh, banks you know to drive the regulation or to form the regulation and then of course they will endorse it and uh, rather than the you know the regulator dictating it and here i just give an example industry bank of china what they did uh you know in the past couple of years and this is a very interesting bank. It's, it's only a mid-sized bank i mean the you know the assets like one trillion uh us dollar is not the largest bank in china and uh, and they have already um, come a long way in terms of fintech, because the uh, even ten, more than ten years ago, they are the first company that uh, launched a banking of a service to the small and medium bank in China. And you can imagine there are so many uh, small, tiny banks, you know, in China, and uh, which don't have system, don't have process, etc. So they are the one that launched this uh, service then more than a decade ago. And uh, the the small and medium sized bank actually uh, subscribe a core banking service from uh, from uh, CIB. And uh, and then of course with the fee and and uh, and and that's what they started all the all the all the business and they are like two close to three hundred uh, small and medium sized bank actually subscribe the service now, and they have evolved a long way and in this particular uh, you know uh, picture as you can see they actually uh, launched this service uh, I think about two years ago it's called the Credit Lend, Lend Cloud so this is the actual the core service um, within CIB and um, because again. A lot of the small and medium sized banks do not have that facility, or do, they do not have the right technology, or they they lack the channel to attract uh, to acquire customers, new customers. And so this is a new offering, you know, from CIB launching to the uh, small and medium sized bank in in China, predominantly uh, in the um, uh, covering both uh, retail and the um, small and, uh, SME business in China. So as you can see, this is the lenders, you know, that they partner with the uh, the, uh, the CIB, and then um, they have basically formed uh, all the pipes and plumbing and everything is actually done by CIB, and all they have to do is to link up with uh, uh, the you know the lenders, you know, you know, with the open API, and I think they have um, uh, they've created like uh, two two hundred plus you know open API endpoints, you know, in the you know in the different businesses, and this is just one of them, and um, and and so that they can. Uh, leverage this um, open system to connect with the different lenders, and and of course, in addition, they also join up with uh, some of the fintech players. And uh, the fintech players, um, meaning some of the system providers, for example, uh, which is more advanced. And uh, so, for example, there's an underwriting uh, system that uh, they have um, used. You know, uh, they, they have actually employed the uh, um, bought from the fintech. Uh, company and which is integrated in their credit lending cloud, and this become part of the service export to uh, the lendings, uh, the, the lenders in in China, and then uh, the co lenders uh, or any other associate sort of partners, uh, credit bureau etc. All connected to this cloud, and uh, and and of course you know the the beauty of this is that you know apart from you know doing the you know co lend you know doing the co lending with other join with other lenders. They can also do their own proprietary uh, loan application directly to lenders you know, th themselves uh, without you know, other uh, players. And so this has been proved to be reasonably successful because it's still experimental. Uh, they only launched about two years ago. I think they, are, they have signed up three clients already. So this is um, um, CIB. And the next one is actually uh, CCB, uh, Construction Bank of China. They, um, uh, similar to CIB, they also um, have been Doing some experimental experiment in, in in the market as well, and uh, what they did is the to they revamp the system. And uh, one one point I forgot to mention is that both the CIB and CCB in this case is actually the fintech arm that actually create this uh, business. So so that's why they they actually leveraging a entirely separate entity to create all of this. Uh, either you call it new ecosystem or new technology or the partnership with the other uh, so-called fintech. 
um, uh, partners. And in you know, and then while the the actual mothership is actually doing the digital transformation, so this is a pretty cool setup. I think you know it won't disrupt the, what the CCP or the the main banks are doing themselves. Um, so coming back to this is the um, with this um, this basically all of this core service is within CCP. They actually uh, build it themselves and uh, or they buy from uh, elsewhere, and then they export everything to a partners. So. You can imagine, you know, if it's another bank or another company that will have a uh, selling a service to the consumers, so it's it's becoming a, like a uh, banking as a service or private label service, you know, uh, with the uh, the platform providers or the partners, and uh, where the backbone of a technology is all within, you know, uh, CCB cloud and all provided by CCB. So again, it's more like a, a partnership model, you know, with all of its uh, different companies, and um, in this picture on the right hand side, you can see this is actually the, uh, the digital um, user portrait of a CCP when they try to map out all the client, you know, client within the systems. And you know, uh, if you look at the uh, a lot of the banking apps today, um, they all try to mimic uh, WeChat, for example, because they try to create an ecosystem. So you can buy movie tickets, you know, on the in the banking app. I'm not talking about WeChat. And you can actually go to market and you know uh, order food and you know and, and then they deliver you know uh, from wet market or the food service or taxi hailing etc. So it's all this is actually integrated into the the banking app. So by the same token, you know CCB Cloud is actually trying to provide the same service to the uh, through the platform. And they try what they try and do is to uh, using their system to sort of embed into other fintech players own ecosystem. Because they, they they know that they can't actually compete with all the all the other WeChat uh, players, and uh, because uh, uh, as one of the speakers said already today that we, we well, I live in China, you know, I basically I live on WeChat, I, you know, I live in, on my phone. I don't bring cash anymore, and everything is is on my phone. So um, this is where we uh, where we're in China, and so um, now we we'll quickly got jump off to Hong Kong. And uh, Hong Kong, the financial regulatory structure, I think most of the people probably, uh, especially those who, who are from Hong Kong, will know quite familiar with the Securities Future Commission that look after the uh, security side, the broker side of it, and then where the uh, monetary authority look after the banks and the insurance authority, of course, the insurance sector. And in here, uh, again, uh, use the same um, format. You know, on the left hand side, you can see the traditional banking license, you know, bank. Uh, or you know, Hong Kong is quite simple. I mean, just three tier banking structure: licensed bank, restricted licensed banks, and deposit taking companies. That's it, and it's all MA. And then on secure size, you know, there are um, nine type of uh, sorry, ten type of uh, different uh, licenses that you can get through the SFC for the uh, the brokerage business or advisory. And on the right hand side, there's the most interesting part, which is the virtual banks, which um, has launched about two years ago. Uh, more like uh, to, you know, 2019 in, in particularly. And um, this is where the um, HAMA has uh, given, you know, proof uh, new licenses, you know, for uh, virtual banks in, in, you know, in Hong Kong, in, this, in, in, the, uh, uh, in the city. And so all of the bank, retail bank services, actually you can go through the, you know, offer through the internet. So it's branchless um, instead of, you know, uh, um, opening banks, you know, with, with the physical branches. So in here, it's I think it's pretty clear, you know, the uh, uh, the with the MA already launches surface, and then if um, and if you look at the, the players, uh, which is highly diverse, you know, in Hong Kong because it's no uh, Hong Kong's no stranger to fintechs for many years, and uh, on. Uh, but what's interesting in here is that um, the incumbent financial firm providers, you know, in Hong Kong, they are big, you know, uh, foreign banks and mainly foreign banks. I mean, not that they're very very few really local Hong Kong banks, you know, HSBC is really a Hong Kong bank, it's really a British bank now, right? And uh, and then the uh, predominantly, if they are uh, dominated by Stand Charter, all this, you know, uh, all this other company, and BA probably one of the few really local players. And, uh, but uh, I think, you know, they've been slow in this reform, you know, in the last, you know, uh, in the last decade, you know, in, in particularly, you know, uh, uh, entering into the digital age. And um, you know, on the right hand side, you can see the virtual bank uh, where the uh, uh, the eight banks already license already been uh, given. And uh, so this is something that um, I think uh, is too early to say how it's going to evolve because you know they only came out you know uh, last year, and uh, 
And then, uh, but certainly, if you look at the uh, the fintech landscape in Hong Kong, it's definitely very very exciting. And uh, I can see that you know the uh, this is going to have you know there's a lot of things that long expected. You know, will they inject also you know the uh, the you know some of the um, counterparts like WeBank and MyBank in China and put it in Hong Kong, and uh, or even tapping into that bank population in Hong Kong. You know, that's a bit uh, too early to say, but. Uh, but I think it's it's uh, it's definitely something that you know uh, people look forward to, uh, and then in in terms of the uh, API regulations, I think the MA um, announced already some initiative for the smart banking, but overall open banking structure. But a, uh, open API in particularly, there have also been a paper already been uh, drafted and uh, also uh, publicized, you know, with, with the NHA MA uh, website ready and uh, and. And the open API framework, uh, there's all four phases that have to undertake, you know, by all of the banks in in Hong Kong, and uh, and I think uh, at the moment, I think 20 banks participated with about 500 open APIs already they've been developed, and uh, uh, but uh, and also MA is actually uh, taking a very liberal approach in terms of timeline, you know, where you know when uh, there's no specific timeline, you know, uh, telling them you know when you're going to get it done. And uh, so again, all this could change how you know um, things are going to be standardized, you know, in Hong Kong in time, and especially with the virtual bank, you know, coming to play, and then with the main bank, you know, the incumbent banks also uh, doing the digital transformation and entering the race together. Let's see, the... Greg, you've got two minutes. Sure. Uh, this really is the last slide. You know, the all the banks in action today in Hong Kong. I think. Uh, is uh, is is you know Citibank report by far the uh, the most advanced in terms of you know uh, they started like uh, 2017 ready and then providing the uh, uh, they already have the um, architecture open architecture and then they already have the direct access to uh, given now to the uh, to the uh, consumers or the uh, some of the uh, retail industry where they can link up to uh, the Citibank um, open API endpoint so. I think um, all of this is actually um, happening in in Hong Kong, but again, I think uh, as compared to China, I feel that you know, it's, uh, Hong Kong is very interesting. I think in time, especially how they're going to evolve as a smart city, you know, with the ambition from HMA. Uh, but at the moment, I think it's a bit uh, early. And uh, but uh, what I uh, one last comment I have is that you know, it would be very interesting to see that more and more mainland banks actually uh, setting up their branches in Hong Kong and uh, setting up business in Hong Kong. And there will, there's a flood of, you know, uh, uh, banking, you know, and brokers, you know, all entering Hong Kong ready. And that is going to have some major influence in that because they will be one of the uh, major powerhouse, you know, um, uh, you know, defining the landscape in, in Hong Kong. And vice versa, I can see, you know, HSBC also launching some of the open API service in, in China. And then all this is, I think, um, of course, for as long as you have the capital, uh, the uh, capital control or currency control, you know, you don't have the free, you know, uh, money coming in and out of the country. They will be quite separately handled. But in time, five or ten years time, you know, if it actually when China opens up to the world, you know, the rest of the world, I think that is going to be quite a fascinating place to to be in. You know, in this whole uh, region. So, um, and and that's why I think you know th th there's no doubt that you know it's going to re reshape the industry and orchestrate the frictionless, uh, so-called the um, a journey across you know different channels and industry. So this per, um, very much um, wrap up uh, my presentation today. Fantastic. Thank you, Greg. And I actually learned a, a new acronym today, which is ABCD, uh, AI, Blockchain, Cloud, and Data. So I'm definitely using that and in, in <laughs> talking about it as a takeaway. Um, I also thought it was super fascinating. Um, I, I did have a question for you about, um, uh, you mentioned that you know, banks in China are basically pushing uh, these standards to happen and really pushing innovation uh, as, as a main aspect. And you did touch upon that at the end, right, of it'll be super fascinating uh, to see what happens when those banks which are pushing some of the edges of innovation uh, come into contact in a way with, uh, you know, earlier in the, in the session we heard about standards and open APIs and this and that. And uh, so there, there's all, or almost like a, a standards-based approach from uh, some of the other places like Singapore and, and Europe and US and so forth versus the innovation that's being pushed in from China. So uh, it was a question, but I think you already answered it. So I think that'll be super fascinating to watch and see what happens. 
Thank you. Yeah, fantastic. All right.